river. Basically, the landlords had pretty well given up. Uh, there were legal vestiges of serfdom still around, but in practice, nothing much was done to enforce it. Uh, there were some landholders uh, down in Swabia, for instance, the Abbey of Kempton, tried to sweeten the pot a lot by offering far more favorable lease terms to persons who were legally serfs of the abbey than to free farmers who came in to take leases on a cash basis. Uh, they would uh, give them tax rebates, uh, all sorts of things, uh, but it really wasn't very widespread. And I, as I said, vestiges of it lasted for a long time, but those vestiges tended to last in what Eric calls the region of the second serfdom, east of the L, Brandenburg, Prussia, Pomerania, Mecklenburg, where the serfdom that was gone by this period was reinstituted in the period later in the 17th century and had to be gotten rid of in the 18th. Uh, to give you an example, uh, my grandfather was born in Poppenborg, um, Ems, uh, which is on a dinky little canal up on the Dutch border heading toward Ostfriesland in very northwestern Germany. Poppenborg, at the time we're talking about, had nothing in it. It was an empty peat bog. The town wasn't founded until after the end of the Thirty Years' War, and when the uh, local guy, Dietrich von Balen, founded it, he gave out the leases to the town, not on a basis of personal serfdom, but on the basis of land serfdom, the land owned servile obligations to him. Now by the time of the revolution of 1848, two centuries later, there were no longer any peasants digging peat in Poppenburg. They were all either sailors or shipbuilders on the coastal trade, but still the town owed the guy these servile obligations for the land that they held their houses on, and they had to get together a lump sum and pay them off. So almost like the seven sharecropping system. Is, is that kind of what we're talking about? No, not really, uh, because uh, like, sharecropping, you owed a certain crop. proportion of the crop. Uh, to the owner of the land. Uh, for these, what you owe is a fixed rent, just like a corporation farmer, you know, can let out today. Uh, a lot of uh, my father uh, and grandfather were uh, farmers, and uh, when I was growing up back in the 1940s, uh, they had 100 and acre, 180 acres of land of their own. Now this, even in the 1940s, was not enough land on which to make a different, decent living. So uh, in addition to farming their own land, uh, they leased a lot of land from neighbors, uh, one from an elderly widow, one from a doctor who had just bought a farm, and you know they rented it, and, uh, paid him the rent, and they took whatever profit, they took whatever loss. Uh, so it, it's a commercial lease agreement, really. Uh, but uh, I say, but complicated by the fact that uh, there are legal vestiges of older types of land tenure floating around that have to be accounted for in the legal documents, which is why the legal documents are also very long and complicated and have 17 subclauses uh, accounting for unlikely but possible uh, ramifications if Lawyer the... Paradise. Well, you know, if the current landholders, stepfathers, first wives, cousin, who married, you know, 
uh, they, the leases trace out, you know, what is to happen in the case of any, one thing that they really had to cover was uh, who would manage the land if there was no adult male to farm it, but the lease was still valid. The one thing the landowners were always interested in was assuring their income stream from the rent, which meant that some, somebody had to be there to take over the work, right. even if that person wasn't allowed, a, you know, the lease holder. wasn't the lease owner and really got no benefit from the lease, but they had to designate. They would hire somebody uh, who would meet certain qualifications in that kind of case. Uh, a trustee. Hmm? A trustee, but a trustee who would actually do the work. Uh, yeah, and uh, again, that is not unique by any means to early modern Germany. Uh, my grandfather's father died when my grandfather, who was an only son, was only seven. And uh, there was, you know, a big case in the county court determining who would be responsible for managing that farm in the best interest of the heir until such time as he was able to take it over with all provisions, you know, and the farm is to be managed in such a way that uh, he will finish high school, uh, he will be sent to the state university, uh, he will be prepared to earn an honest living if he is not physically able as an adult to do, undertake the strenuous work of farming. You know, all the, the, the care and feeding of the children, the heirs of the leaseholder, of the original leaseholder, was an important concern of every village council because a village was an ongoing corporation. And if, you, if your leaseholders died out, uh, and this leads again to something. The village corporation, the village councils had authority. The landowner could not simply give a lease to a stranger without the approval of the village council. How long were leases for? Three lives or 99 years, whichever came first, was the most common. But as I said, uh, near a big city where the city council was leasing market gardens and things, they tended to be much shorter because the city council was interested in controlling their tenants and maximizing uh, the produce they got. Like micromanaging, in other words? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but they're like 99-year leases you get nowadays for commercial. Yeah, well, these were commercial. Uh, it wasn't like renting a house. It was your job. It was your Very much. occupation. It was your profession. Uh, but the council had the right to refuse someone. And they could refuse them on a variety of different grounds. Uh, I've seen uh, city, town, count, village councils refuse a candidate for a lease on the grounds that he was known to be uh, a brawler when he got drunk. They didn't want him in the town. Uh, I've seen them uh, refuse it on the grounds that he wasn't considered to be a good money manager. Uh, they didn't want somebody wasting. He could be lazy. This man has a general reputation for being lazy. Uh, and the village council could refuse somebody that uh, the guy, now remember, as I've said, it's rare for all of a village to belong to a single landlord. Uh, usually the village, you can have villages which were divided in 15th shares. Usually the guy who's really making these negotiations is a local lawyer in a real estate manager. Uh, in whose hands the management of the village was put. Uh, the villagers uh, were quite capable of and often did 
appeal over the heads of the local manager uh, to usually the largest shareholder in the village if they didn't like what he was uh, doing. Uh, you have uh, instances, uh, numerous instances, when uh, the person who is managing uh, the village on behalf of the multiple people who had ownership interests in it uh, is suspected of malfeasance of the function. But uh, they, there are wonderful lawsuits. They go on for decades. Uh, the villagers against the landlord on how to value the annual crop of acorns in the landlord's portion of the common forest. But why did they go on so long? Why? Because either one side or the other side was not happy with the result at the latest instance and appealed to the next higher court. And by the time a suit got all the way up to the Reichskammergericht, or the Imperial Supreme Court of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, it could have gone on like great expectations, you know, for decades and decades. Uh, but uh, farmers had the right to sue the landlords. The landlords had the right to sue the farmers. The farmers had the right to sue one another. And they were, overall, an extremely litigious batch of people. Uh, yeah. Illustration I have that I use sometimes of the village lawyer in which there's a line of people coming into the little office and the guy is sitting there and he has a whole stack of shelves with cubby holes behind him into which he is sticking papers and he's busy scribbling away. Uh, he was responsible for keeping track of all that sort of thing. Was it impossible that he was arguing both sides of the case? Um, it pretty much was. Yeah. Uh, you know, these are really are fairly small units. People know what one another are doing by and large. Yeah. But all of this comes back to the fact that the use of the land the basic use of the land was not in the authority of the people who owned the land, usually. It was in the authority of the people who leased the land. Land use was managed on a village level. As long as they paid their rent, they could do what they wanted. They could do what they wanted, which means that for Stories involving something like the Grange in 1632, it's both an opportunity and an obstacle. Right. It's an opportunity in that the village does not, by and large, have to ask anybody else's permission to make changes. It's an obstacle in the same way that any kind of democracy is always an obstacle, namely that people are going to sit there and argue about it nearly added. <laughs> right. Well, really, you know, don't like it, though. There, there, are, there are some big projects that you're going to have to have.